So again, welcome everyone to the second day of the ICT52 workshop. Um, we saw many good presentations yesterday on the uh, 6G vision and radio and sensing. And today we're going to see presentations on architecture and hardware for 6G. The first presentation is on uh, uh, from HexX on architecture components and enablers by Morton. Yes, thank you, Patrick, Miko. So um, this is then from the architecture work work package in HexAX, and it's an um, overview of our first first deliverable, uh, you can say, a rather high overview. And uh, the slides here has been made by all partners. You can see these uh, partner names above here, so it's not only me. Um, let's see. The goals of our work package are these three goals. Uh, we have the first goal is to have some data driven network uh, and then the AI integration network probabilities is part of this. And then we have the concept of network networks uh, and to, to enable this, we need to be more flexible and adaptable uh, than we are now. Um, assuming that we have a cloud native, there's a little bit noise. I don't know if someone had not muted. Uh, cloud native RAN and core network, we, we think we can streamline and redesign the architecture a little bit more efficient. Um, so this is the outline then for, for our, we'll start a little bit with the gaps here and try the gaps just to, and, then, and we'll deep a little bit more in some of the enablers. Um, so we had already from the beginning a, a couple of ideas how to, to uh, do this work. Uh, one of them was this too, that uh, we have the cloud. Cloud is a big trend that we need to assume that we have a cloud native RAN and core network. And service-based architecture was also something, and so softwareization, obviously. So that's a trend that we we already knew, but we found it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we need to deal with that. Um, and then we also found out that uh, there are many new uh, Way, communications, not only about communications, it's uh, AI and sensing. Um, sensing, I think, not part of our original thoughts, but it's something we need to also think about when doing the architecture. Um, orchestration and use of AI for that was also a trend and something we see as a sort of gap here. Um, another thing we've noticed also is, is about regulations uh, that we need to de handle. Um, it's maybe not a trend, but there's a gap perhaps we need to uh, look into for the 60 architecture. Sustainability need to be in all parts of the work. Networks and networks, as it said, it's, uh, we see that uh, the satellite networks are coming and we think that there might be more D2D mesh networks and, and, and uh, multi-hop networks. So, so we need some of more work of this uh, for 60. And programmability is also to make the network more adaptable. Um, so these are trends. So out of these trends and gaps, then we we've tried to make some some architecture principles uh, and point in a direction that that is guiding us. And when, when we work with these uh, all these enablers and components, so we'll try to briefly explain this. We have three areas in this work package. We talk about the intelligence, flexibility, efficiency. And you you saw these different goals. Also, they are three goals in three areas. Um, so for the network intelligence, we have then two different principles. One principle is that the capabilities um, should be exposed to the end applications, end-to-end -end applications. And the network should also be designed to automation. The implication of this is that we need AI and programmability in the network. And we also need some uh, analytics that we can uh, that is more efficient than we have for 5G. Um, network flexibility is obviously that we have flexibility <laughs> and uh, scalability, which is then to that we can uh, deploy different uh, sizes of the network much easier than we can now. So it's uh, small networks and large networks should it re should be really easy to scale up and down the networks. Uh, resilience and availability also something we see that could be even better. Um, so some of the enablers for this is then to to look into mesh networks, satellite networks, and how to integrate this and and uh, also non non-public networks. 
to, to have this network or networks integration, as we say here. Uh, increased network efficiency then is then we should have the interface that should be service based. Um, and we also have something we call separation of concerns on network functions. Uh, we'll come back a little bit to that and, and then simplify the network. This, this uh, separation of concerns of the network, we think that is important for the, we, we have this uh, cloud, cloud rather than core network that we need to, if we want to make the network the, uh, more efficient, the signaling and, and the protocols and so forth, we need to rebuild uh, the, some of the functions, network functions, so they are more independent. So we can uh, don't have to. We can maybe have less interfaces and less signaling uh, to try to be a little bit more efficient. Um, so that's these are the guidelines then for the principles. Now I will dig into a little bit in the, some of these areas, the intelligent networks. And so I will not dig into all the parts that we have of the latest deliverable. Uh, so that's just too much. So here are the blue boxes are, are then placed. On, yeah, you can see this is the U with the application interface. And then we have the cloud rather than core network uh, and the application server. So you just place these different enablers and components on different areas that just to give a view of, on what we are doing a little bit. Uh, you can see this is the AI box is about AI as a service, AI, AI protocols in the network. Uh, federated learning, so all these parts are, are working with. We have the programmability, both network and UE, and analytics. We have also dynamic function placement and uh, network automation here. I will just dig in a few of these. I start with the AI. So we have started to do some sort of initial framework for this, where we combine the analytics and the AI. Um, how AI should be working together with analytics. So one of the things we think that uh, we, we should improve then com compared to previous net uh, iterations is that the analytics need to be a seamless transfer of the analytic information across plane and domains as we speak. So the figure here to the right shows uh, then different domains. Uh, we have, this, for example, a deployment of center core cloud, we have distributed RAW and extreme edge. All the analytics here, they, 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 the information should flow freely between these different uh, planes and domains. At the same time, the AI agents should be able to access this uh, analytic information in some way. Uh, and we need to also orchestrate uh, the, the AI by the uh, several functions up here. Uh, we also have AI to the consumer and we have AI inside the network and AI for orchestration and so forth. So uh, AI is a uh, little bit everywhere. So this is the main thinking here. So the next is, if, of course, to do this in a more, much more detailed uh, description of this framework. Uh, we also work with, with, as I said, federated learning and, and things like that. So it's not shown here. So. Um, next concept we have then is this the, about the programmability and you and network probability. The purpose of these probabilities is same for both UE probability and network probability, but uh, they, they are quite different in functionality. So the, 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 the reason we want probability is to have a more flexible, adaptable network. Um, and, and we think, for example, that the special programmable UEs can, can then be tailored for, for uh, industry that like, like sensors or dedicated networks that are, have very special needs that are not really part of the normal standardization process. So we can maybe build in uh, or any, this should be any UE, it should be a standardized way how to do this. And then some uh, verticals, uh, dedicated networks can then uh, have certain add-on on their UEs. Uh, that that make uh, help help their their industry uh, on the behavior. Um, for for the network side, the the probability is a slightly different. It's still about flexibility uh, and try to improve the network as much as possible. But here we should the the, the problem here is more that we have a lot of different. Uh, uh, it says a lot of network entities, a lot of different types of hardware and, and the nodes. And not all nodes are are uh, uh, 
um, suitable perhaps to have uh, the same functionality, programmable functionality. Um, so there is more about the placement decision here uh, and uh, to, to improve the, the performance, the latency. We, we have, for example, here packet processing latency, say. So that's also something we look into. We will look into the how to do this uh, in a standard way to the UE probability, and this will also be how to do the, the uh, placement position, try to make this uh, some, some estimate of this in the future. Flexible networks, a large area here too. We have a um, couple of boxes. So here I just show a part of this. We have a few new functions we call ad hoc network control and node discovery. But we also work with multi-connectivity in ways to do that and, and lay, layer one and two mobility. Uh, on top of that, we have something I put them outside here. It's not, not functions, perhaps it's about the satellites, apps and so forth. Uh, mesh networks, private campus networks, and so on. So we'll just talk a couple of, of, of these boxes, so not time for everything. Um, we start with the, the network of networks and the satellite part, maybe most, and the campus networks. Um, the motivation for this is that we have a goal to make a, a show the enablers for uh, global coverage, full global coverage, we say. Um, and the, the, we can have a look at the red maps here, the, the globe here to, to the right. So here you see then with, the, with, the, with some white spaces, this is the, the case when, when the satellites are not really, they are not allowed to have inter-satellite link hops between them. So if there is a user here and wants to communicate with a, with a base station over here, then this is the maximum distance this satellite can, can uh, uh, cover and obviously the orbit, uh, how far away in orbit it's the satellite is, the better it is, of course. But uh, then you have a problem with the delay, so that's a trade off. Um, so, if we allow a couple of hops between satellites, as is shown here, we are actually able to cover the whole Earth. So, that uh, implies that we need some architecture to allow efficient uh, inter satellite link hops between uh, the, the satellites. <laughs> This is shown by the transparent and yet regenerative architecture. So we probably then go for something. There is a little bit noise in the background. Can you please mute? Uh, that is satellite have a base station on in this uh, the base station in the satellite. So then we can do uh, similar to D to D. We can do into satellite uh, link ops. That's it. Uh, then we also have another way to improve the coverage and, and um, flexibility is something with, with is a concept here of mesh networks, D2D mesh networks. Uh, here we come back with this ad, ad hoc network controller. So the concept a little bit like this, that it should be possible this ad, ad hoc network controller to build new networks on the fly. Also then if the networks done it, if the devices are now not really having a normal coverage, for example, this access point is not online, you still try to, to find these devices that are out of coverage by multi hop and trying, trying new connections via different access points. So there, there, this is work is about finding the best connectivity options, um, probably looking to D2D, but maybe other mesh networks. Um, and it's a lot about discovery and selection procedure, but also looking into the trust issue and so on. Um, finally, we have the efficient networks. Um, this then is about uh, this, or uh, we, we said uh, the one of the principles was to have a service based uh, interfaces, a service based architecture, then is part of this. Uh, and we should then have uh, something called cloud native signaling. This is the improved signaling. Uh, talked about earlier, function refactoring, and then we have compute as a service here also. I will just talk about a few of these. Um, so one thing I just, this is an example of, of, of something we will work more of, is about this efficient signaling, assuming that we have this cloud run and core network. We think we can do better than we have currently. For example, this is a, a, a signaling procedure for a handover, the UE would like to do a handover, and these are different network functions, so it's uh, uh, AMF and the user player functions and so forth. 
So, which is then sequential, you see, they, it's another request, another request that all depend on each other. So the UA want to do hand over, you have to go up through, through all these network functions and then back again, which obviously is, as it is, it's still rather efficient, but it should be possible to do a little bit more efficient with things. Uh, and send these in parallel, all these requests directly to all network functions and then receive them. So, so to speed up, make it simpler. And maybe it's mostly because it's more flexible, but this is not that easy uh, as it's just looking at this. We need to make these network functions then more uh, uh, separation of concerns, as you say, they, they be too less dependent on each other. Uh, so here there are dependencies now that we need to uh, look into these functions and see how they can be different from it that they are now, so we can make more efficient signaling. Um, that's the way we think now is we started working on this. Uh, then just a little bit about the, um, we have also thought about computer as a service. Uh, the idea here is, as you know, that compute that you have a, some sort of device, for example, that has massive, they want to do some computing and it's not really want to do it um, itself. They want some other uh, node to do this compute for, for you. So then it can, can uh, find compute resources here and the compute resources could be any entity, network entity and a device also. So we need to, a method to connect these uh, devices or entities with each other via this uh, schematic protocol we have here. We try to attach them uh, and we try to then uh, process the task and, and, and compute this and so on. The, the challenge here is that you know, first of all to, to make this protocol efficient, but also that uh, how, how do you do this? How do you select the compute resources? Uh, uh, so we will look into this, for example, how reliable these compute resources, how fast they are, energy efficiency and so forth. So that's a trade off there. Summarizing, this is the deliverable we have uh, in, from end of December. So summarizing that we have data driven architecture, we have an initial architect AI concept sort of, including analytics and, and AI agents. We have a network of networks uh, looking into to, uh, satellites and mesh networks and, and campus networks and so forth. Uh, and we have this assuming cloud raw network core network and raw and core networks. We we we, we uh, working towards a more efficient networks, for example, um, separation of concern and so forth between the with functions. But we do a lot of other stuff here also. Um, next step, just shortly, is to look into more details, make a better framework for this AI and AI as a service and analytics and federated learn and continuum orchestration altogether. Uh, we will continue the UA network programmability. We continue this stream, how to streamline the functions and signaling, uh, and we'll continue with these match networks and the network and networks. And we also have, I just listed the two different KPIs here that we will look into. We, we have more, uh, for example, we, we try to we, we look into how to improve the network convergence time. If, uh, if there is a, a change in the network, how long time will it take to uh, adapt to that? Uh, assuming that we have this flexibility where they can adapt to different uh, new deployments and so forth. Uh, AI overhead, we also will look into. Uh, we will also look into how to increase the reliability and ways to increase the flexibility to network so networks. So these were the things. I, I think I'll stop here. So uh, many thanks, Morten. Uh, very yeah. interesting. Uh, are there thanks. any questions from the audience? You can put them in chat or raise your hand in the bar above. Doesn't seem it's like okay so. No. Yeah. Crystal clear. Yep. So if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat and Morten will reply to them later. Yep. So thank you very much. Um, let's move on. Ah, there's one question. 
Security was named in context of D2D ad hoc network controller. What is the general consideration concerns for security for 6G? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't have an actual uh, um, uh, security, looking to the security as a, as a uh, specific activity. With we'll, we will anyway look into this, and this mesh network is more like the trust issue we will look into, maybe not the security, but more like the trust issue. Uh, but uh, we have other areas we look into security. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. So we'll see where we end up with it. So we, are, we haven't forgotten. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there were more questions. Maybe Morten can reply to them in the chat. And we yeah, move on with, right. the, yeah. with the agenda. So next presentation is also from Hexex uh, from um, on gap analysis and technical work plan for special purpose functionality by Jörn. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Hope you can already see my screen, hear me, see me. Yes. Yeah, Great. We can see okay. you on the slides and hear you. Good, good morning. So I'm going to present uh, the work package seven deliverable we published uh, mid of uh, last year on the gap analysis and technical work plan for special purpose functionality. Um, and maybe to set the stage, our mission and scope, we also contribute to the uh, roughly the same objective as Martin just presented. So the expansion and evolution of the network into new use cases. Um, within work package seven, we kind of have a, a very dedicated focus towards uh, extreme experiences. So we focus on specific use cases, um, specific enablers for those use cases that later on allow us to extend the 6G network to such extreme experiences. And this is also what we presented in our first deliverable here. So we study enablers for increased dependability, for sustainable coverage, and also uh, enablers for digital to twins and novel HMIs, uh, which were not detailed in this deliverable yet due to a later start of that task. But I'm going uh, still to talk a bit about that as well in this presentation. And as I said, this first deliverable basically contains the results of our gap analysis of the alignment with the use cases KPIs, and then outlines what we uh, intended to do in work package seven. And we will also give an update on that uh, in this presentation now. As Morten also said, uh, all the partners contributing to work package seven contributed also to this presentation. So I'm also only presenting on behalf of basically the whole work package uh, seven crew here. A few words about uh, how we proceeded uh, towards this first deliverable. Um, we started by detailing core set of IoT uh, and an industry 4.0 use cases um, that match to the target objective that we have in work package seven. For that, we uh, analyzed the set of use cases that were also published in an earlier deliverable in work package one, which was uh, presented yesterday, and then grouped those into two focus areas. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Based on those use cases, we followed the methodology outlined also in work package one for KPI and KVI identification. Um, so we studied the use cases and extended the KPI KVI definitions based on those use cases. Um, we worked on the alignment of the definitions across the different use cases and uh, experiences or extreme experiences that were targeted. And we also looked into what could be indicators for key values. Um, so towards the concretization of key value indicators uh, from the work package seven perspective. Based on that, we, as I said, identified the technical enablers that would contribute beyond the state of the art towards achieving those uh, use cases or towards realizing those use cases. And this then resulted in a, a work plan of uh, plan contributions for work package seven, which I'm also going to briefly address in this presentation. Now let's first talk about the core use cases for work package seven. Um, guess and hope that most of you saw this picture already yesterday. So these were the use case families and use cases that have been detailed in HexaX deliverable D1.2. Um, within work package seven, we focused on a subset of those um, and grouped them into two main areas. So on the uh, top left, you can see the area of dependability in industry 4.0 settings. There we looked into more detail of the use case interacting and cooperating mobile robots from the robots to cobots family which also includes some aspects of uh, flexible manufacturing. And we looked into uh, certain aspects of telepresence use cases, uh, or more notably telepresence video conferencing and telepresence robotics that contribute towards this overall dependability uh, aspect. And one use case from the massive twinning family, the digital twins from manufacturing, that obviously is also a nice fit uh, with the other ones regarding dependability in industry 4.0. 
On the sustainable coverage side for uh, IoT, we looked into uh, one use case from the local trust zones family, the 6G IoT micro networks for smart cities. We also focused very much on sustainable development use cases with earth monitor and autonomous supply chains. Um, and we have one use case in there from the massive twinning family, which is immersive smart cities that also goes well with the uh, local trust zones use case we selected here. For those two groups of use cases, so one on dependability in industry 4.0 and the other one on sustainable coverage in IoT, we then looked into KPI and KPI definitions um, to capture these aspects of dependability and sustainable coverage. This was then basically the next step, um, coming up with a methodology to capture dependability and sustainable coverage and also additional capabilities and performance characteristics of those use cases. For that, I'm also going to show you another um, figure we already have in the 1.2, which was also discussed uh, yesterday. So the target of uh, capturing key values in HexaX and also new capabilities of 6G. In our work package, we basically start on the lower left corner. So we start with KPIs that um, are intended to measure new end-to-end -end capabilities. So in this case, the dependability and the uh, coverage. It's still called affordable coverage, but we will refer to it as sustainable coverage later on. And from there, we look into what are underlying KPIs, um, so uh, capabilities that need to be extended um, in order to achieve, for example, dependability. Could be something like traffic capacity, location accuracy, so all those KPIs that are stated in the uh, top left corner. And we also looked into um, whether the KPIs or what KPIs could actually serve as indicators towards the key values that are being studied in HexaX. So in our case, uh, trustworthiness um, could be a value that is uh, also affected by the dependability and the inclusiveness and acceptance is uh, a value that is also affected by the sustainable coverage KPIs. We also consider specific capabilities of the 6G system, um, for example, the integration of compute or uh, intelligence as, as other work packages also do, and also the aspect of flexibility um, and how that how those um, capabilities can later on help in achieving affordable coverage or sustainable coverage and dependability. Let me quickly go into more details on those two um, core KPIs we have in our work package. So for dependability in industry 4.0, in general, dependability as stated here is just the ability to perform as and when required. Um, we have five attributes for dependability. I'm not going to read that out here, but these are basically um, parameters of um, dependability. Those can be captured by specific measures, for example, a up down time or time between failures. There can be probabilistic measures that uh, allow us to quantify those attributes. And they basically are used to specify how dependable a, a specific service is. So for example, communication service or a positioning service or a sensing service and so on. And within our work package, we basically have two goals re related to dependability. On one hand side, we want to increase the dependability of individual services. So we want to propose enablers that allow us to increase, for example, dependability of communication. But on the other hand, we also want to have this end-to-end -end perspective because the application later on, so from the use case perspective, will, re will rely on multiple of those services, for example, communication and sensing and so on. And for that, we need to consider all those services in an end-to-end -end fashion because that will then later on determine the productivity of the application itself, so from an end-to-end -end perspective. Um, the underlying KPIs for dependability, so attributes like availability, reliability, and so on, um, serve as an indicator for trustworthiness. This is what I already said, so this is also how we can contribute to the, to the quantification of the key value trustworthiness in HexaX. The second um, target KPI is sustainable coverage. Um, this describes the ambition to increase the spatial coverage, which was also already mentioned by Morton, and thereby also address the value of inclusion while explicitly considering sustainability aspects. So in this case, um, for the use cases that we discussed in our deliverable, we explicitly considered um, basically this trade-off between the cost of insight we can generate by utilizing the 6G system, for example, to monitor the environment, compared to the value that we get out of that. Uh, and some indications of what that could mean um, for the cost of generated insight. This could, for example, be the additional energy consumption we have when we deploy such a system. Could also be the production and distribution costs associated to deploying sensors out in the, in the wild to monitor environmental impact, for example. 
value on the other hand could be reductions in overall energy consumption, could be reductions in environmental pollution, if you have such a monitoring system, could also be reduction in electronic waste or EMF exposure, and maybe um, more on the tricky part, it could be the reduction in uh, unnecessary behavior. If you consider smart city scenarios, for example, if you're able to optimize traffic flows in those cities, uh, unnecessary behavior in a sense of driving around looking for a parking spot could be reduced. This is one value that is generated with the insights. Below we have flexibility, which is basically again describing kind of a trade-off between value and cost here, and also the ability of the system to adapt to new tasks, to new sensing tasks, let's say, um, that we have related to sustainable coverage. This could mean that you need to redeploy certain sensors or you need to reconfigure parts of the system. And here, um, indicators of flexibility could be the greater free use of components that we have, and also the cost in terms of money and resources that are associated to such a change. And we go into much more detail on, on those target on those targets here for the individual use cases. So I'm just uh, showing this, this overview here. For each use case, we basically detail the target KPIs. We describe the KPIs and discuss this trade-off, especially for the sustainable coverage case between value and cost of generated insights. And if you're interested in that, uh, please feel free to reach out and take a look at the deliverable also um, that we just, uh, that we published earlier. As I said, from this uh, description of use cases and their KPIs and KVIs, we then derive the um, work plan for our work package. We also, of course, detail state of the art for the respective enablers that we consider. Um, so I'll just provide an, a brief overview here on this slide. Um, we um, structured our contributions on the state of the art into the two areas, sustainable coverage and dependability with the respective use cases that I just briefly described. Um, for sustainable coverage, we have some, we consider works on energy uh, energy efficiency related aspects. So, for example, energy zero energy devices, uh, strategies for collaborative beam forming, and also this aspect of being able to repurpose existing networks uh, to increase the overall coverage. There's also the aspect of flexibility, which was also mentioned by Morton earlier. So, the ability to change topologies, uh, also coexistence of 3GPP and non 3GPP networks. Um, one aspect that we study here is also the utilization of intents for wireless connectivity. So if you, for example, have an autonomous vehicle that is driving towards a certain uh, target uh, location, you can use that information about the trajectories to basically optimize your, your topologies here. And we also consider the uh, resource assignment between D2D and D2I links. So taking into account the enablers we get from work package five on this uh, meshed networks. On the dependability side of things, we have on the one end to define uh, and, and measure end-to-end -end dependability, which I just outlined. So basically the challenge of coming from the application perspective. Then we have some uh, cross-layer impacts on dependability. And one of those is communication control co-design or communication computation control co-design, um, which basically describes such a cross-layer relation between the application side and the network side. Um, we study the trade-offs between energy consumption and performance um, together also with work package one and the respective task on sustainability there and we look into mechanisms for identification and failure cause traceability which is very important especially in industrial scenarios to be able to to pinpoint to where exactly the the respective failure was caused and then to be able to mitigate or even prevent it and the last technical enabler there is uh, looking into protocols for such um yeah, private networks, reliable private networks, flexible private networks, and also privacy preserving digital twins, which brings me also to the uh, work plan and to the description of the tasks we have in our work package. Um, so we have three technical tasks, one working on ultra flexible resource allocation in challenging environments. I'm not going to read all the bullets here. We have a second task working on end to end dependability, focusing on, on industry field zero environments. So those are the two tasks matched towards the use cases we discussed earlier. And then we have basically a cross-cutting uh, fourth task, um, T7.4 on digital twins and novel HMIs, that looks into an application execution environment, um, achieving the high levels of privacy, user transparency, and availability, basically as kind of the uh, execution environment for the industry fallout zero use cases we described also in our deliverables. Um, we look into methods for human-machine interaction, novel uh, HMI concepts, and also the concept of having uh, 
like personalized accompanying digital twins um, that are able to collaborate with each other with with each other. So rather than building like a meta model of the whole world, you want to federate different digital twins capturing different sub aspects and be able to exchange data in a privacy preserving way between those uh, those twins. As I said, this uh, last te technical task uh, started after submission of D7.1, so we do not yet detail too much in our uh, published deliverable, but there will be a new uh, deliverable out quite soon. So we will have an intermediate report on the special purpose functionalities that uh, is going to be published in May. Um, this will include some updates on the technical solutions we achieved so far. I just jotted down some some bullet points here. So we look for, for the flexible resource allocation. We look into in-X communication factory environments, which basically describes uh, also interaction with um, on machine networks and local networks in a factory environment. We look into this uh, radio wet trajectory planning that I already mentioned, into general mechanisms for optimal resource allocation, um, resource provisioning for federated learning, so also a close link to work package for an AI here, and on ambient backscatter communications and many more aspects which are going to be detailed uh, in this upcoming deliverable. On the dependability in Industry 4.0 side, um, I already mentioned this communication computation control co-design um, cross-layer approach. This is detailed in the deliverable with uh, first results. We look into the error identification mechanisms and also into first results uh, from the POC and demo cases for those use cases. Um, we look into radio resource management and how that can be optimized if we utilize digital twins. So the link to this new or last task in Work Package 7. And as I said, um, we will also present our updates on the quantification and monitoring of end-to-end -end dependability and many more things. Um, the last part will provide an update on digital twins. Uh, so this is basically the task that started a bit later. It will outline and present a, a digital twin ecosystem for the 6G uh, era let's say, um, focusing on human centric industries. So also considering this human machine co-working aspects, considering uh, multi-sensor HMIs that can be utilized as an input for a new sensor, um, yeah, new sensor data to, to derive um, intent, intent of humans, for example. Um, we model the impact of human presence on the network. So if people walk around on a, on a factory floor, for example, this of, of course has an impact on um, the, the network characteristics. We also consider systems where humans are in the loop, for example, enabled by such novel HMIs and aid in decision making or aid in optimization tasks for the network. Um, yeah, and as I said, if we have digital twins for uh, sub aspects of the system and those twins are able to collaborate um, to achieve a certain task, this can then also nicely be matched to this collaborative robots um, use case that we outlined in the deliverable. So this is also one intention or one um, technical result that we want to work on in this task. Okay, and above all those technical results, we also, as I said, provide some insights from our first demos and proof of concepts. So this is also very interesting work that is going to be uh, contained in this first deliverable. And I think with that, I can already close so that we have maybe two or three minutes for questions. So thank you for the attention. And again, please look out for this new deliverable in May. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Very interesting presentation. So are there any questions in the audience? It's crystal clear. I will also okay. answer them in the chat if there's one question. Uh, how the end-to-end -end application dependability budget will be distributed over the network and link layers. Mm -hmm. So this is still also ongoing discussion in the project also with the uh, work package two on, on the radio aspects. So I cannot give you a, like a like a table right now, but the overall goal is that with the flexibility that we have in the network, we are basically able to adapt that for the specific use case we have in mind. So maybe I can also provide some, some details uh, in the chat on that. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, uh, if you have them later, you can post them in the chat. So we can move on with the agenda. So next presentation is from another ICT52 project, the B5G Open, building an open power efficient packet optical white box. 
presentation by Oscar Gonzalez de Dios from Telefonica. Hi. Second. Okay, I hope that you can see the presentation now. Everything yes. is okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present in the workshop today. So here I am uh, going to talk to you a little bit about the B5G Open project and other uh, initiatives uh, around the concept of building uh, uh, open uh, white boxes. In this particular case, we are more focused on uh, power efficient optical white boxes, but I will give you a, a good hint of uh, what are we going to do in the project. And I tell you that what are we going to uh, because we have just started, okay? So we are um, uh, we started in in November. So as you might guess, uh, we are just at the um, at the very beginning, okay? So we have the project for for three years, and we have partners uh, also across Europe. So mainly we are uh, network operators, so Telefonica, BT, and Telecom Italia. We have uh, vendors such as Nokia, Infinera, and Adva, research centers and universities, and also some, some SMEs focused on uh, new access technologies, for example, the Pure Li-Fi or on optical, optical equipment. Uh, here also you have the, the web if you want to, to look into it. And now <clears throat> we'll dig into, okay, what do we really want to do in, in B5D Open and why is it important? Uh, for beyond 5G and, and for 6G. So in the project, what we want to do is to uh, design a new packet optical transport architecture uh, with end-to-end uh, -end packet optical boxes and multiband transmission. So the key design principles of V5G Open is on the one hand, a domainless network architecture Okay, so what we want to do is to break the barriers that we have today. So uh, in today's network, we are all separated in, 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 a, in islands, in domains, and every time we need to go from one domain to another domain, we need to go up again uh, to electrical, do, uh, do processing, go back, so that is uh, quite inefficient. Also, another <clears throat> big concept here in the, in the project is the use of, of multiband. Uh, is a technology that we will see that will enable us to address the capacity needs of today's of futures network. No, today's we are at least by now we are we are okay. The packet optical uh, white boxes. So right now you, you know that they are <clears throat> completely two different worlds. We have few examples out there of this uh, integration that is not a very seamless integration. To build all of this, we need a new control plane. So we are also developing a control plane assisted by AI and machine learning with the end of uh, zero touch, controlling the, the multiband time pr uh, predictions, and also building the network operating system for these uh, packet optical white boxes. So we are, as we are preparing the the, the target of B5G Open is the mid long term okay so we are looking at the if looking at the 5g pvb kpis uh, we are looking at more or less the 2030 network okay so this is what where we are preparing the technology some of the technologies that we are preparing in the project are applicable in the in the in the shorter term for uh, for some of these packet of the overseas, but the, the final the final goal and where this multi-band will uh, nodes will apply is uh, this more long-term evolution so, as mentioned, uh, our uh, focus on our main uh, the technology that lies uh, that lies behind this is multiband. As you know, up to now, the commercial systems uh, mostly use uh, C-band. Recently, the use of uh, L-band was also commercially available, so you can find today there are some few examples out there, there are not much, but there are few examples that also use the the L band, uh, but not the new, the, the other that in they are less efficient, but still usable the S, E and O bands. So if we can make use of the of the whole band, uh, that would mean that compared to what we have today uh, in the C band, we will have a 10 times uh, transmission capacity increase. 
Okay, so so with that, uh, we expect to be able uh, to uh, fulfill the requirements uh, of CXG. Also, uh, one of the key concepts that we have is that given that the, the new bands or the, the extra bands that maybe or the, they have more uh, penalties in terms of attenuation, they can be used for the shortest uh, distances. This has been proposed in, in the literature, but it's not really realized. There are not even prototypes able able to do that. So here in the in the project, we are going to build and prototype uh, three different uh, uh, node architectures. OK, so we have um, one that we call this uh, the multiband passive interconnection node. So uh, this is fully built uh, without uh, without filters and a low cost band bypass separation. Okay, So this is one of the things that we are going to prototype. Uh, also a multiband optical node where we have a, a partial bare band switching capacity. So here what we want to avoid is the very low granularity in the in the switching. Uh, this is where the node would become uh, more complex and, uh, and more expensive. And finally, a switching matrix that uh, can operate beyond the conventional uh, bands. OK, so we can operate across all the all the multiple bands. Okay, so with these nodes, this will be the basic or the basic part of our optical uh, optical infrastructure. And for the transmission, uh, our goal is to create packet optical nodes. Okay, so that is that the the pluggables. Okay, the, the pluggables that are the really the uh, the pieces uh, that. Uh, um, Will take care of the transmitting the bands will be inside the inside the uh, packet boxes. Okay, so uh, ideally uh, we will start working with uh, open operating system like uh, like Sonic. So with this, if we are, if we manage to integrate uh, this into the or the pluggables into the routers in an efficient way, uh, this will avoid having. Uh, what we have today that is a pluggable in the in there, uh, let's say what we call a gray pluggable, a non colored pluggable in the router. Then we have a separate transponder and then the, the line system as well. So everything, is, let's say the, the electrical part is, is duplicated. OK, uh, here we will start, of course, with the state of the art pluggables that are in the in the commercial in the commercial bands. Uh, the aim is as they become available, use the other bands. Also, as mentioned, one of the key concepts of the of the project is the end to end uh, the end to end architecture uh, based on this continuum end to end architecture. So the idea here is to be able to uh, to apply or different slices based on based on bands. OK, so as you saw earlier, the different bands have different uh, different attenuation and so different behavior. So, so what we can do is to create different uh, using the same network infrastructure. We can create um, different slices for different uh, requirements. But what is important is that in any in, in all of them there is an optical transparent an optical end to end transparency. So that means there will be uh, in order to match the stringent CG uh, uh, requirements, um, we can guarantee to provide to provide more. Only by providing all these uh, all these bands, we would be able to to provide them. Otherwise, we will exhaust the optical resources. Also, one of the key concepts as mentioned earlier is the is removing the boundaries between network domains. So, for example, the backbone and the metro. So, what happens as today is that if we reach to a boundary in in the optical, we need to go electrical, even if it's a node that is very close, and we need to do a, a restoration or we need to find an alternative path. Uh, we need to go to to electrical. We cannot use uh, the uh, the network that is uh, uh, even adjacent. So we have two pieces to in, in, in a country. 
for example, in Spain, we have divided the country into several regions. If we, everything that is in a region is okay, but just one kilometer away, you cannot cross. Okay, so here one of the design principles of the project is to remove these, these boundaries, use the whole optical infrastructure and uh, avoid this regeneration. So we have this domain uh, concept, which is quite uh, disruptive from what we have today. Also, one of the, mm, the technologies that we are exploring is the point to multi point. So in this point to multi point uh, optics, so you have with a single uh, device, uh, multiple subcarriers, and uh, the concept is that each of the subcarriers, in, instead of going them to the same destination, that you can uh, split the subcarriers into multiple destinations. So with a single uh, optical transmission device, you can reach uh, multiple destinations. Okay, so that. <laughs> that allows you to reduce a lot the, um, the electronic uh, in the intermediate terminations. Uh, so we are exploring how to use this uh, technology efficiently, how it integrates with the IP network, how can we reduce the complexity of our IP network that is always now based on point-to-point -point, uh, transmission. Also, with this, um, uh, with this technology of these uh, multiband uh, uh, slices, we can also support massive small cell deployments. Okay, so we can uh, also push in, uh, push into the edge, and uh, also we can enable and also using this uh, point to multi point uh, transmission, uh, we can en uh, enable this this part of the transmission. Another part of the project that uh, is focused on the integration with the Li-Fi technology. So that is a seamless integration of the access and the metro. Okay, so also to avoid, as we have today, like um, a hardest a hard stop between the between the access and the uh, and the uh, network or the transport network itself so so here as you can see from the life life accesses you can go uh, directly optical colored uh, through to other other nodes so uh, going beyond beyond 5g or beyond our project i will uh, tell you what uh, what are the, the challenges that we have so one of the challenges that we have is the the ip and optical integration Okay, so as as you saw, we have like two two port, two things to work with. One of them is the introduction of these coherent pluggables in the packet optical boxes and this point to multi point transmission. Both of them eh, they they still remain a challenge to to do. So there is a need to do this IP and optical work together and also change the way of designing the IP layer. So here in the left in the right side. This is the, the structure of the IP network of Telefonica, which is a hierarchical, a hierarchical approach uh, because it is designed with today's technology. So we, if we go for this IP optical integrated, this will imply a, a, radical, a radical change. Also considering that uh, we are going to introduce, especially in the edge of the network, a lot of computing capability, which will require a lot of connect intra connectivity in this part so we believe this ip optical integration is um, is really key in that part and uh, also the we need to build the, the optical the open transport node so that they support natively this optical transmission they can also uh, do optical bypass with for example with the with the filterless approach that we mentioned earlier with open operating system and exploiting the IP and optical integration. So with this, we can build open open routers. So where where do we build this? I mean, the, 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 the problem is where do we build this? So there are several places where we can build this. So one of them is the telecom infra project. So this is a collaboration between different companies. So it's a it's a private effort, OK? Uh, but companies join together, put the resources uh, from uh, from their side. So this is not, not not public funding. 
and uh, with the goal of designing these open and disaggregated networks based on on standards so here the, this is the uh, this is the structure of the opt project so here as, as you can see there are, there are like it's building several layers so building the hardware itself so uh, open cell side gateways open routers uh, such as the open bng dbbr for core and um, uh, and the, the PNG, also the disaggregated optical systems, so building also uh, the line systems, having the SDN layer, uh, working with the integration with other people optical integration and working with the NOS. So you see that this is a private effort with companies covered, trying to cover this. And there are some examples here that I'm going to show you of the, of the kind of products or designs that have come. So one of them is the the open transponder, for example, this is the Phoenix that and this is an open an open white box just uh, transmission. Okay, so that is uh, uh, transponders that we can uh, uh, deploy um, uh, autonomously. Okay, so it is uh, fully fully disaggregated at 400 line interface. So this is one example of it. And the other in the router part, for example, this is the, the open BNG, which the uh, the, uh, there is a joint RFI between multiple vendors to, uh, and it was um, the RFI, the results are now, were announced recently, and it's a collaborative effort between multiple operators. And just to conclude that uh, with this, I mean, it's, uh, it's not enough. I mean, we have worked in, uh, in BFAG Open, we are working in all these topics, but in the end, it's very few partners very very few partners for example there is one partner working in the in the nose there are some partners working in in the nodes but uh, but that is not enough really if we really in europe want to build the technology okay we we need to target the design and development of open disaggregated nodes okay so we have some technologies to consider as a base we have operator requirements uh, already got. So we need to develop new hardware and software. Uh, there, we don't need it even to focus on vertical use cases. We have plenty of use cases. There are a lot of EU projects covering use cases. So here are the keys. We need, <laughs> we need also uh, to work on creating and developing uh, these, these nodes. Uh, in Europe, unfortunately, we have very few people who is working uh, in this. So as I encourage to uh, that in future EU calls, we can also uh, cover this uh, this gap that unfortunately now only Chinese, Taiwan or US companies are mainly uh, working in this and not, not Europe. So with this, uh, I conclude the the talk from before you open. So if there are any any questions, uh, I will be glad to, to answer them. Many thanks, Oscar. So if there's any questions, please add them to the chat or raise your hand. Nothing yet. Uh, so very interesting talk on how the optical uh, networks would fit into 6G, I think. There doesn't seem to be any questions at the moment. So in the chat, is there some question in the in the chat? Uh, uh, there were the previous presentations. Okay. So. But please feel free to add your questions to the chat. Oscar can monitor them. OK, let's move on with the agenda. Um, the next presentation is from the Marcel project uh, by John Vardakas. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. see your slides. 
also you can see my slides uh, perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Bardakas. I'm representing uh, Marshall in this uh, <clears throat> uh, workshop. Uh, Marshall and uh, in this uh, presentation, um, the focus is on the network architecture, um, uh, which is related, let's say, we, we also consider optical uh, uh, technologies. Um, so, uh, in a few words, uh, Marshall uh, targets to, uh, to propose a new paradigm of elastic virtual infrastructures that uh, integrate a, a set of uh, different technologies at the radio edge, at the uh, regional edge, uh, also at the network, networking management level and the security, uh, network security level, uh, which are developed under our framework, at the framework of our project in order to deliver an end-to-end uh, transfer, processing, and storage uh, services in an efficient and, of course, secure way. Uh, so we have divided our work into uh, three different parts, three different uh, pillars. The first is, and this uh, I'm going to focus on, uh, the network design, uh, where uh, uh, we push self-free networking towards the distributed processing self-free concept. Uh, this is the first approach we consider the radio edge. Also, we have a, uh, 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 wireless millimeter wave solutions, which are implemented and will be integrated with existing VRAN elements, while also being in, in line with the ORAN alliance. Uh, our second, let's say, pillar is uh, built on the uh, elastic edge computing notion, where we target to optimize the functionality of the MEC and the network slicing management systems by considering a hierarchy of analytic and decision engine. And we also have the third uh, uh, pillar uh, where we <coughs> consider the, the, this architecture in order to apply the, the uh, solutions that we developed, uh, ML-based, uh, machine learning-based mechanics that guarantee privacy and security in multi-tenancy environment, targeting both end users and tenants. Um, so we uh, also uh, we are also working on the network security part. So regarding the architecture, let's start with the radio edge part. We consider two different approaches for the uh, for the radio uh, edge. The first solution is based on the distributed processing self-free concept, as we call it, where we uh, are working on the development of a novel self-free paradigm, where we disaggregate the classical CPU node of the of the self-free concept into different many uh, multiple uh, distribution units they use and supporting distributed computation and coordination between access points and between the use. Um, so in, in our approach in, in, this, uh, in, in this scheme, we consider clusters of access points serving uh, one user, and uh, all these uh, different access points are connected to different uh, uh, DUs. So we have a jointly address of inter DU and access, to, uh, access point to DU coordination for the first time. Also considering the specifications, the characteristics, the constraints of the of both the front hole and the mid hole links, uh, we are also working on the development of since we consider clusters of access points uh, serving the users, we are working on the uh, development of data driven, uh, dynamic uh, cluster formation algorithms, uh, with an emphasis on real time operation by considering our approach. In uh, the second approach for the radio edge, we have um, a new hybrid uh, MIMO front holding approach, specifically targeting cell-free uh, networks by considering advanced beamforming and beam sharing uh, capabilities. Uh, so we have a, a new, let's say, access point topology adaptation in the cell-free uh, networking approach. We have advanced scenarios where access point can be reassigned to different DUs on demand. Uh, uh, also, we have point-to-multipoint -point connectivity supported through uh, bin sharing from multiple access points. In this, uh, so by considering this approach, we have uh, we can say that we, we can unlock practical self-free deployments in 6D networks, allow them to significantly increase spectral efficiency. Uh, we have uh, set a target to uh, increase it by a factor of two by considering network specification because we have a high number of access points, and of course, interference cancellation. And as I mentioned earlier, we our work is also uh, is aligned with the ORAN Alliance architecture. As you know, the, the ORAN represents an evolution of the CRAN, further disaggregating the BBU 
and complementing the 3GPP 5G standards through a foundation of virtualized uh, RAN network elements. Uh, the ORAN uh, uh, this aggregated the BBU into two parts, the distribution unit where we have the real-time functions and the central uh, unit, the CU, with the no real-time function. Uh, we have considered this approach in our uh, architecture where we uh, also consider the fact that the CU is further disaggregated into the CU user plane and the CU control plane. Uh, in our approach, in our network architecture, the CU user plane function uh, and the DU are deployed at the radio edge, while the CU uh, control plane at the real-time rig at the regional edge. Uh, also, the cell-free high, uh, high uh, physical layer functions, the modulation, the precoding, uh, which are part of the considered uh, radio units, are integrated with uh, the, the DU and the MAC scheduler by considering a 5G fabric-like interface. So we have uh, a selfie support addition uh, in the ORAN architecture for the first time. Uh, so uh, our, our work uh, targets to contribute with different uh, self-related innovations to the, to the ORAN architecture. So we have the, uh, first of all, the distributed self-free networking support, where we implement it as part of the, uh, the ODU uh, module. Uh, in order to consider the uh, terminology of uh, ORAN, where we are properly modifying the physical, the MAC, and the RLC sublayers. We have uh, a cell-free radio resource management at the near real-time rig, but we also need a complementary distributed uh, radio resource management solution as part of the DU in order to locally schedule the resources of the underlying part of the radio edge node. And of course, complement complement the global view provided at the at the, at the level of the near real time rig. Uh, and of course, we need extensions of the existing interfaces and control plane protocols to apply at various and uh, different uh, reference points in order to incorporate support uh, for the self free networking. Uh, so going a little bit uh, uh, away from the <laughs> from the radio edge. We also propose a novel, and this is where we incorporate optical technologies, a novel uh, fixed mobile conversion solution in order to facilitate integrated connectivity of both mobile users and fixed users. Uh, um, for example, FTH, uh, uh, to support FTTH services uh, that share the same uh, mid hole and edge infrastructure for example, the MEF host, and are both served by the, the, by the same, uh, the same uh, core. Uh, so we have two different transmission approaches seamlessly integrated at the regional edge node. We have the uh, standard point to multi point, uh, po sorry, point to point uh, connection where we can consider um, uh, um, uh, uh, wavelength division multiplexing, and of course, uh, an, uh, a very disruptive point to multi point uh, approach based on the next GS uh, PON solution as you can see in the figure, in order to support both uh, wireless and, uh, uh, and fixed uh, users. Mm, sorry, okay. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, uh, there is a problem with my mouse. Um, so, uh, by considering, I have, I have an issue with the mouse, sorry. I can not uh, give me a second. Uh, probably there is an issue with uh, automating auto or uh, changing the slides. Give me a second to to change it. Sorry for this. I did not notice it. Uh, Anyway, uh, let's keep it here and yeah, and I, I can continue to, to, to talk. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, can, I cannot control the slides. Uh, 
So by considering this architecture uh, that I mentioned earlier, going to the network management level, we have a, uh, we envisage a new paradigm of the edge infrastructure uh, uh, based on the notion of elastic uh, edge computing. Our work is motivated by the fact that the previous approaches targeting optical wireless convergence in previous projects in the CRAN are uh, centralized, uh, so it's, they are uh, suboptimal for, the, um, for our solution. Also, the ORAN is centralized because, again, problem, uh, uh, the orchestration automation layers uh, are deployed at the, at the, at the core tire. So, uh, our uh, work uh, proposes and implements a novel hierarchical control plate solution. Uh, um, federating the two uh, SDN controllers of the fixed um, uh, segment and the mobile segment uh, under a common orchestration subsystem. So for the control plane of the mobile segment, we have a disaggregation of the non-real-time control uh, function in order to achieve near real-time reactions to work uh, workload variations. Uh, we also propose the deployment of SDTN, Software Defined Transport Network Controllers, at the regional edge in order to control uh, the fixed segments so that they can uh, work together with uh, the, uh, the SDN controllers of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the mobile users, um, and we also consider an energy efficient scenario can be considered through uh, traffic aggregation on a limited set of wavelengths, which will allow shutting down individual uh, 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 transceivers at the at the point level. And also, uh, we consider this architecture in order to apply uh, the predictive dynamic slicing approaches. Uh, 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 in order to leverage a, a machine learning uh, driven control loop to trigger slice reconfiguration proactively based on uh, convolution uh, convol convolutional sorry, uh, neural networks in order to predict, uh, predict uh, traffic fluctuation. And a few words about the, the security. Um, our work in the security, in the network security part is divided into three parts by considering the architecture that I, that I presented earlier. So in order to support uh, a multi-tenancy, uh, uh, we have uh, a decentralized blockchain-based platform that supports network slicing transactions through a smart contract uh, for contracts integrated with the net network slicing as a service subsystems. Uh, we also uh, working on the implementation of a new privacy preserving context representation for the exchange of the local embeddings and an innovative technique that guarantee that embeddings cannot be reserved. Also, we are working on the policy driven data protection and the great assurance where we propose a new uh, distributed cloud storage solution offering strong guarantees that the reconstruction of any portion of original storage is impossible. Uh, uh, we also propose and implement an innovative NFS gateway controlled by the OTT application provider. Also, a, a unified solution for data obfuscation and integrity assurance based on the above. And the third part of the network security is about the hardcore accelerated machine learning based data plane security and play, uh, malicious traffic detection, where we consider two different engines uh, uh, the threat detection engine and the threat analysis engine. Uh, targeting to provide hardware accelerated solution for a decentralized uh, approach for the third detection en uh, engine. And uh, uh, a centralized uh, threat analysis engine. The, uh, the, this, is uh, this is the uh, uh, work that we currently uh, focus on uh, for uh, seeing where we are going to, to put these two different engines in the network architecture of Marshall that I presented earlier. Uh, also, by considering this architecture, we have set up uh, a number of uh, experimental scenarios under uh, uh, two uh, POC levels. The first is about self-free networking in dense and ultra-dense hotspot areas, and the second is about cognitive assistance and its security and privacy implications. So the first um, scenario is about dense user-generated content distribution with a millimeter weight from hauling, where we have, we consider an event with a high number of users and access points. 
where access points are uh, uh, interconnected with the ODU nodes serving the users in a coordinated manner. We also have the second approach for the Radio Edge, the hybrid MISIC MIMO uh, front hauling solution. Uh, and the performance is evaluated by considering a pre recorded video content in a video streaming Mac app deployed at the, uh, at the regional edge node. The second scenario is about the ultra dense video uh, uh, traffic delivery in a converged fixed mobile network. Here we consider the, fi uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fixed mobile convergence approach. Uh, where, sorry for this, I know. Uh, we have. Um, uh, both the uh, fixed network elements, the point-to-point uh, uh, -point and the point-to-multipoint uh, approaches, and the evaluation is by considering a, a, uh, uh, a pre-recorded 4K video, both for upload and uh, download through a video streaming make application deployed at the regional edge. Uh, the third scenario is about the deployment of two real-time interactive cloud-native applications for outdoor sightseeing supporting uh, human-centered interaction by considering 3D cameras uh, equipped to uh, equipped to AR glasses, where we have two different applications. The first is on real-time video analytics and visual guidance, and the second is about cognitive assistance. Uh, virtual representation of an artifact uh, uh, projected at the at the glasses, and the, finally uh, the experimental scenario about uh, uh, data security uh, and privacy uh, uh, in multi-tenancy infrastructures, uh, where we demonstrate how the usage of smart contracts. Uh, 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 smart contracts can be uh, can be uh, paired with a private representation of data, allowing information sharing among different tenants and the owner of the infrastructure that can be in the, uh, uh, interested uh, in the optimization of different mas uh, machine learning models. Uh, so these are the four different experimental scenarios that we consider in order to provide proof of concept of our idea. This is the fact sheet uh, where you can see uh, uh, in our uh, website, uh, more details about uh, our project. Thank you very much. And sorry for this uh, mess up with uh, this, this slideshow. I don't know what happened. Try to <laughs> uh, <clears throat> to present it uh, uh, to present our idea. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, it's an interesting overview of the Marshall project. Are there any questions from the audience? Seems, <clears throat> seems clear. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. Doesn't seem like there's any questions. OK, then thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we can move on to the next presentation. Uh, we will now hear from uh, on the perspectives on 6G architecture from Lulu from China Mobile. Uh, good morning, uh, I'm Lulu from China Mobile. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, invited to attend this 6G workshop today. Um, China Mobile has been uh, investing in innovative research of 6G network architecture and the technology. Today, I will share our thoughts on the architecture vision and the key technology perspective. At the end of 2021, 3PP has started the standardization work of 5G advance, which will include release 18 and release 19. It's expected that 3PP will start the study work of 6G around 2026. That is, it's probably release 20. There are two different paths to 6G. One is to design a new 6G system that can be independently networked. 
which is expected to be deployed in 2030. The other is to consider evolution, gradually introduce some key technologies of 6G into 5G advance to make 5G smoothly transit to 6G. Although the ideas of these two passes are very different, but they both reflect our expectations and goals for 6G architecture design, which should be innovative and compatible, which also increases the difficulty of architecture design. After two years of exploration together with our academic and industrial partners, the IMT 2030 Promotion Group in China released the white paper, 6G Architecture Vision and Key Technology Perspective. In this white paper, we have reached a preliminary consensus on the vision, design principles, and the key technologies involved in the 6G architecture. I think it's a fixed achievement of 6G architecture design. Although at present we don't know the specific service of 6G, um, various research institutes and industries have put forward their own views on the vision of 6G. Based on these views, we proposed the vision of 6G architecture. We think the vision will have four characteristics. First, it's native intelligence. 6G network will embed artificial intelligence capabilities to achieve architecture level intelligence. Native intelligence can be used internally to optimize networks and externally to provide intelligent communication and computing services. Of course, the ubiquitous intelligence in 6G needs the support of computing. So the second characteristic is computing and network convergence. Network and computing will be deeply integrated. They can be aware of each other, cooperate with each other, to achieve efficient computing and network services. At the same time, the 6G architecture should support multi-domain integration. In addition to the mobile network and home network that we have already supported in 5G, we should also consider the deep integration of air and space network, body area network, as well as the service continuity under the integration. Finally, security is important. In 5G and the previous release, we always design network functions first and then consider security. In the initial design of 6G architecture, security issues should be considered to achieve the endogenous security at the architecture level. In order to meet the four vision characteristics, we analyze the driving forces of 6G architecture design. First, new requirements brought by new scenarios such as emerging communication will drive the network architecture. Technology integration brought by artificial intelligence blockchain, digital twin, and other new technology will also drive 6G architecture. And the changes of networking brought by the development of IP technologies will drive 6G architecture design. Before we design the network architecture, we hope to reach a consensus on the principles so as to better converge various ideas on architecture design. We came up with two principles of ins insistence and four principles of transformation. We should not only insist the network compatibility considering the interconnection with the existing system, but also 
uh, we need to insist the minimalist designing. With the idea of homomorphism to achieve unified protocol and control, considering the limitation or unresolved problems of 5G network, we hope that the architectural design of 6G should consider four transformations from centralized architecture to distributed architecture, from the heavy incremental to minimalist integration, and from external to endogenous, and uh, also from ground access to space and terrestrial access. These form the basic principles for designing 6G architecture. Based on the principles, we propose a preliminary assumption of 6G architecture. With the collaboration of centralized and distributed, the global oriented core functions can be centralized and the distributed autonomous functions can be extended to the network edge. We named the distributed autonomous function SCU, that is small cloud unit. The SCU can isomorphic on demanded expansion and has the unified protocol. It can be plug and play and also can be combined with digital twin technology to achieve self-organization and self-evolution. This is the outline design of 6G architecture. In order to support the design of 6G architecture, we summarize the future network technologies to 12 items. Uh, it's including six potential technologies that directly affect architecture and the six potential technologies that affect capabilities. And then I will select several items to share in detail. First is the potential of architecture technology. 6G services will become more ubiquitous, so the network architecture leads to support a more distributed network. Except the collaboration of centralized and distributed we mentioned before. We can consider to integrate distributed technologies such as blockchain with 6G network to provide decentralized test services, which is trust as a service. And also through the distributed technology to implement user-centered network to provide fine-grained personalized services. The multiple accesses of the space and the terrestrial also have an impact on the architectural design. In the future, the network is, uh, is expected to support global seamless, three-dimensional coverage, and the ability to access broadband anytime and anywhere. The integration of space and the terrestrial Restrial is the basis for realizing continuous communication between different axes. We need to study the flexible and efficient integrated network architecture to solve the dynamic topology, high transmission delay, low networking flexibility. And also we need to study the mobility and session management dynamic routing technology to solve the problem of breaking speed caused by the fast speed. Of course, there are problems about service guarantee, how to introduce delay detection, delay prediction, resource scattering to achieve the service guarantee for the bandwidth and the delay. 5G network introduces NWDA to support network intelligence. 
But with the emergency of the new 6G scenarios and the development of artificial intelligent technology, through external plugins to implement network intelligence are uh, insufficient in terms of uh, efficiency, performance, energy consumption, and pri privacy protection. Therefore, we need to study how to provide AIS based on the heterogeneous resource facilities of connection plus computing. Study the management and orchestration of network artificial intelligence and through a multi-layer collaborative mode to provide efficient network intelligence services. The final potential architecture technology I want to share is Computing Force Network, which is proposed by China Mobile and is expected to be a new technology system for computing and network integration. The Computing Force Network will consist of four layers, Computing Infrastructure Layer, Computing Routing Layer, Computing Service Layer, and Computing Orchestration Management Layer. Computing Force Network is aimed at applications um, both with computing and network requirements. It can efficiently orchestrate computing and network resources based on the awareness between computing and network. Regarding all the potential capability technologies, I'd like to mention semantic communication. The 6G semantic communication network perceive everything in communication and empowers the knowledge of perception of network communication. Semantic communication network can perceive, um, for example, environment and object, data and content, and also network topology and state. Another potential technology that I want to share is Immersion and mat sensation. It can provide immersive, real time interactive and multi sensation. This is an example of immersive and interactive network architecture. It will have three layers, including application layer, network layer, and the perception layer. Through new Media codec, media intelligent distribution, multi streams control, and the QoS perception, and also network routing to implement the immersive and interactive services. Finally, I will have a quick summary. The key factor of 6G will be the innovation of network architecture and the technology because air interface technology is almost approaching channel limit. So the network architecture and technology innovation is regarded as the main method to improve 6G network performance. And the integrity of DOICT will support 6G architecture design. DOICT will drive the network evolution and capability improvement. The last one, we hope and we need a unified 6G architecture standardization to promote sustainable development of the industry. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you all and looking forward to the further collaboration. Thank you very much. Uh... I assume since this was a recording, Lulu is not available to answer questions. Yeah, un unfortunately, we are overlapping with this Chinese uh, New Year high period, uh, but uh, certainly uh, questions to Lulu can be conveyed via HexaX. Yes, so if you have any questions, you can um, send them to me or Miko and we can forward them. Um, since we're a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, we can have a short break.
um, until 1040, so five minute leg stretcher. And we continue uh, with Cornec presentation in five minutes. Thank you all. So welcome back from the break. Uh, hope you all managed to grab a cup of coffee if you need it. Now we'll continue with the second part of this session, which is hardware for 6G, with the first presentation uh, from Cornect, Trustworthy and Energy Efficient Computing in 6G by Gerard Fettweiss. Fantastic. So here we go. I still share my slides. Thank you everybody for um, coming to this nice workshop. And I will talk about trustworthy energy efficient computing in 6G. So where do we come from? Obviously we know that this is an old slide of mine. This I've been using since 2003. 
um, we see that we have a data rate increase of 10x every five years. And as we increase the data rate, 10x every five years, this is doubling every 18 months, Moore's law, things have been challenging to actually deliver this kind of data rate increase. So challenging that if we look at Wi-Fi, oops, it's not true anymore. Already since 2008, there has been a bend in this curve, reaching around a gigabit per second. And we are now in the red curve in the cellular also reaching this gigabit per second rate. So the question is, are we running into the same challenge, the same curve? What is it that we really have to look at? And I will talk a little bit about a, a um, paper now, which and some content of a paper that uh, Holger Boch and I wrote, um, and you can read more about that in that paper. So if we have a look at it now, the energy challenge is obviously big. We need more resolution ADCs, analog digital converters. We need massive MIO. We need virtualization of the radio access network. We just heard a lot about it this morning. And we want to increase the data rate 10x every five years. So for 6G means 100 times higher. Not 1,000, not 10, 100. We have, however, a little bit of a problem. Moore's law is slowing down, as we know, and this slowing down has hit us a bit at 5G. We saw that the energy increase from 4G to 5G is about 3x in the core network part, in the radio access network part, sorry. And this means we see this is actually due to what? A little bit of this slowing of Moore's law. Um, if we then want to now virtualize the radio access network, we have to deal with a couple things, not only Moore's law. In addition to that, we of course have inefficiency of processors versus custom hardware. We have operating system overhead and possibly the lack of accelerators. So virtualization of the radio access network, everybody knows cost, if we're lucky, only 10 times more energy. Which means if you're running your campus network at your manufacturing plant and you on you have your compute server sitting there doing all kinds of jobs in the manufacturing plant and you just have yet another virtualized um, computer sitting in there doing the virtualized RAM, a virtualized machine. You can do that with virtual machines on your existing infrastructure, all is good. You don't talk about that. But if we really want to roll out virtualization in a bigger form, we're hitting a challenge. Now, if we look at this, the challenge is actually even worse if we look at the analog to digital converter on the receive path. And this is weird because, I mean, so far, people were worried about the transmitter and the power amplifier inefficiencies and these kind of things. I want to point out that the receive path analog to digital converter is a true challenge. If you look, the advances in ADC, um, Performance have been in so-called Walden figure of merit, femtojoule per conversion step. So if you have a two-bit analog to digital converter, you have four steps. Or you have a three-bit analog to digital converter, you have eight-bit quantization, uh, eight quantization steps, so eight quantization step. And here you have the clock frequency on the x-axis. So you see that in the end, we have a linear dependency of the energy as we increase the clock rate. And we see that we have about, what is this? Almost 100x improvement over 10 years. This is what Moore's law has been able to give us. Wonderful. But if we look forward, we see two challenges. The first challenge that we see is Moore's law is promising at most 10x, even though we want to increase the data rate 100x. So we have to clock the analog to digital converters 10 times faster. 100 times faster, whatever. We need more resolution. And the second challenge is here, this bend of the knee. Suddenly, it goes from a linear power consumption to a quadratic power consumption. And this is just due to good old silicon. Meaning, if we put this together and look at where do we come from, this are, these are terminal numbers in ADC converter. Um, resolution, as everybody knows, you have to add about plus minus uh, about five plus minus one bits quantization level on the base station side. 
So, but the, basically the tendency is exactly the same. So we see we have been adding two bits of resolution per cellular standard. We have been adding 10x in bandwidth of the analog to digital converter. And so the, we get a figure of challenge in terms of quantization steps per second that sort of increases almost 100 times every um, generation, which is fine so far. But if we then say we want to increase the data rate by 100x and just go along this typical line, that means we have a problem that this 10x now is from going from 200 megs to 2 gigs, we're in the knee, gives us a 100 times power consumption increase. We have another 10x, which gives us another 10x power consumption increase. So in total, a thousand times, but Moore's law gives us one tenth. So we still end up with a hundred times the power consumption. And this is not so nice. Why? Because on the terminal side, we're talking about like a hundred milliwatt power budget for your ADCs. And so today, suddenly it is 10 watt. Now, there's no terminal that can have an analog to digital converter consuming 10 watt. On the base station side, we're at very different kinds of range, we know that, but still going from a watt to a 100 watt ADC converter, this is infeasible. So what can we do? We can go revisit good old Shannon, and we know that our data rate increases, happens because we um, add more bandwidth, we add more MIMO streams, we do more antenna gain, link budget, and we increase the signal to noise ratio. And if we look at the individual parts, all four have a challenge. Two of them actually show us that this is not a quadratic, but an exponential problem in the power, uh, power consumption of the ADC. And two of them give us only a quadratic challenge. And this is new. So far, bandwidth was linear, and that was great. And this is what we've been using and writing on. And we've been writing on the fact that Moore gives us quite some nice uh, situation. So we really have to look at the analog to digital converter. Um, there is some good news. The good news is that if we look at today's cellular network, we have uh, a nice uh, 120 degree sectorization. And so we average out the traffic happening over the area all over the place. If we have a detailed analysis of the traffic, and here just an example of uh, Manhattan, um, then we see that we have a log normal distribution if we go into the individual pixels. That means now with massive MIMO getting the link budget improvement and the capacity improvement, massive MIMO, we're starting to address these little pixels. We don't average out anymore. That means we actually will be seeing the log normal distribution. That means like 1% of the time only are we really at maximum data rate and then we still have the long tail. And today's systems are built around the full buffer with maximum data rate hammering out the whole day. This doesn't happen over 24 hour period. This doesn't happen over every area pixel that we'll be addressing. That means we only need to drive those beams at that super high power consumption where the data traffic really needs that. And if this is only 1% of the time that we have the 100x power increase then we're back to normal again, then we're fine. That's a little bit of the idea because the other beams have ample spectrum availability because they are not in full buffer mode. So we have abundant resources available at 3 a.m. in the morning. So we can use impulse radio. Think of it. If you have two gigahertz of bandwidth and you want to do a 10 megabit video, we have 2,000 times more spectrum available, uh, or 200 times more spectrum available, sorry, than we need. We can even use impulse radio. So 10 megabit per second in this term is super narrowband. So that means we have cases of abundant. We have high, we have medium, and we have low. And for every single gear, for every single mode, just like when we drive a car, we use a different gear for every single mode of operation. We just need a different gear, a different modem, and then we're fine. That doesn't mean we get rid of OFDM, but we just use the most advanced fancy OFDM in those cases where we need it, 
and we have complete different gears. We might even go back to GSF GMSK or zero crossing modulation, some more advanced kind of systems or impulse radio. What does that mean? Looking at what we have been having over the generations, 1G, 2G was voice delivery, 3G, 4G data delivery, 5G, 6G tactile internet, object del uh, remote control of objects, 1G for business customers, 2G for consumers, 3G business smartphones, BlackBerry, Nokia communicator, 4G for consumers, 5G, we're talking today about 5G for business verticals, ultra reliable low latency for business terminal uh, uh, users, and 6G will be consumer mobile robotics. It's going to revolutionize our whole world, not only our little lawnmower and our vacuum cleaner, but really a breadth of consumer mobile robotics is going to be supported. Every time we went from the business version to the consumer version, we changed radically the radio access network and the system to make sure that it's low cost, low energy. We went from analog to digital. We went from CDMA to OFDM, and we will need to go again to something different. And there, this time, maybe not a complete new physical uh, radio access network, but this gearbox idea of using multiple different gears. That's a complete different kind of approach, yes. The second topic that we then have to think of is, great, we then have a physical area, the physical uh, air interface that can address the consumer needs and bring the cost and energy down to a completely different level. But now it's not bits and bytes that we control and send over the air, it's objects. So if we lose a bit and byte and that's compromised, it's terrible. But if objects are suddenly hijacked and taken over, people can physically be harmed. That means, what is it? How have we designed our system network so far? Are they really trustworthy? The whole discussion between whose equipment vendor stuff are you going to be buying and can you trust? So we did an analysis, uh, the Backhaus and we and uh, AI Network and Sikunet, and uh, did a risk analysis on ORAN. And uh, if we look at ORAN, I mean, it's great. If we have the 3TPP RAN. And if you look at ORAN, the nice part is, yes, you have uh, all kinds of additional interfaces. And these all kinds of additional interfaces give you a much better breakdown and accessibility and flexibility. But the question is, in addition to the 3GP interfaces, you have then all kinds of other interfaces. That's nice. And however, does that help in terms of trustworthiness? So we looked at this. We said, let's look at this in this term. If an attacker was an outsider, a user, a cloud operator, an insider, or an ORAN provider. And we said, let's look at this in terms of the methodology saying we have to look at confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, accountability, and German Zurechenbarkeit, and privacy. And if we look at it in that case, we see, okay, we have basically to look at best case and worst case. And best case meaning everything that is standardized in 3GPP is activated. Worst case, only the minimum set of encryption and, and uh, trustworthiness is activated. And we looked at best case or and specification worst case. So, and if you take the whole thing and put this into this map, you see it is really a whole bunch of holes. Um, we have some green spots. The good news is we do have some green spots. But uh, as soon as you say an insider cloud operator or RAN operator is going to be able to have employees that not all of them are acting to what they're supposed to do, uh, it, you have a challenge. And the plus in the red points, we even uh, can tell you how to do it. We have high confidence how to compromise these kind of networks. That means we have to start thinking of standardization in a different way, because right now standardization is done for functionality only. And we just assume 
every employee at the equipment manufacturer is the perfectly good person. Everyone at the cloud operator is a perfectly good person. All the insiders there, the users, they're all good people. And we only look at possibly attacks from the outside. But these, some of them are really not considered at all. And um, that means, and we have to also look at availability because that is part of building trust. Because if suddenly the network is not available and your car stops in the middle of the road, maybe not so good. This means we have to standardize also in a different way, saying we have to build an ontology and write it in a code, just like IEEE standards are done, many of them, like H.264 and others, that can be read by a machine. And we have to implement them also component-wise in a machine-readable, trustworthy language like Rust and not like C. Then we can do formal verification of components, and then we can somehow build a formal verification of the system. And this is a possibility that we cannot do in 5G, because 5G is already all the pros, the essay that we have already, the tens and thousands of pages. So that is an issue. And then if we have done that, then we have to make sure that we implement this on a hardware platform that is trustworthy. And there, if you look at it, it is a whole a hardware platform depends upon semiconductor process all the way to operating system. And it has all kinds of different components. And the question is, where is their trustworthiness? And this is where Cornet comes into play. So if we, for example, take a RISC-V as an architecture, and there are European implementations available, there are US, there are Chinese, there are all kinds of different implementations available. The privileged instruction set architecture that supports the operating system already today we can show you has major challenges. You can comprom compromise the system and you can build another melt-on inspector equivalent kind of a problem. So we really have to redesign the RISC-V. RISC-V is not a solution. It's a great step, but it's not a solution. We have to build a complete new level of trust in an architecture and then build a multi-processor system of chip fabric that then we can extend with via remote attestation into the cloud from the terminals and vice versa, and run by a trustworthy microsystem uh, microkernel, which is then really making sure that it has the hardware support and the software features, uh, the software providing the software support for the software to be implemented. And not like now, one company builds an x86, another builds an operating system, and surprise, surprise, it's like Teflon sitting on top of each other, but not interlocked. So in summary, I want to say we really need improvements. We need improvements on the energy efficiency, and this needs a new physical layer approach. We need something like a Gearbox 5 that also is then implementable with trustworthy efficient data processing because Moore's law from an energy improvement is the good news is giving us 10x, the bad news is it's not giving us 100x. We have costs that currently are, if we were designing just like we're knowing it, we're really in trouble. And it's really nice talking about AI and other kind of features, but these are very basic challenges and of course, we're going to support AI in the future systems. But if we don't address this, who cares about all the nice other features? And we have to be trustworthy by design. This means we have to change the way we standardize in 3GPP. We have to change the way we implement using languages that can be formally verified. And then during runtime, while the network is up and running and the patches are being added, we have to make runtime checks, the next big issue. And we have to have a hardware, an operating system, and a remote attestation system, attestation and remote attestation system that really can make this kind of a distributed network a trustworthy network. And then no questions will ever be coming up if we can trust that piece of hardware, software, equipment or not, because there it is, completely formally verified, checked, done. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Are there any questions from the audience?
So a uh, question, could you please clarify whether the gearbox Phi is proposed for new 6G spectrum or should also be considered for enhancing the use of 5G spectrum, FR1 and FR2? I think it should also be used for enhancing the 5G spectrum or replacing what we have now in the 5G spectrum. Think of it this way, right now in the 5G spectrum, if you have 100 megahertz of spectrum available and you're just using one resource block because the data rate is very low at 3 a.m. in the morning, you're running that big A to D converter hump behemoth just for that part. Think if you were able to improve your power consumption that much, that would be gigantic. Or another example, today, if you build, if you roll it out in a rural environment, we know that bearers, channels, are not fully loaded. And it's a really a cost problem because you have to pay for the super cool base station that can do everything, even though the average data rate that you need there is never ever reaching the peak data rate. So that means we can even say only gear one to three are implemented for rural base stations and gear four only for um, for urban or suburban kind of base stations. So you can make a low cost, low energy version that is then deployed rurally, completely compatible and everything done. So I think if we really do this in that kind of a way and also bring it to the lower frequencies, we really have an answer to building systems that can meet the cost benefit, the, the rural benefits, the energy benefits also for existing bands. Thank you. There are a few more questions, but uh, in order of time, you can reply to them in the chat and we move on to the next presentation. So thank you again very much for the presentation. And we move on to the next presentation from Cornect, uh, RF enabling technologies for terahertz communication and sensing by Piet van Bark. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes, and we can hear you. And see you. Okay, yeah. So I will talk about uh, RF enabling uh, technologies, uh, mainly for uh, terahertz uh, communication and sensing. So in the uh, 6G, the, the, the functions uh, sense, compute, and connect will be um, heavily entangled, as we uh, expect. And now comes the question which uh, hardware uh, technologies can support these ideas? Well, I will focus on the hardware between the antennas and the complex digital signal processing. The digital signal processing, of course, we know that it will be realized in a heavily downscaled uh, CMOS. <coughs> okay, uh, 6G, yeah. <coughs> It will make use of the spectrum of uh, 3G, 4G, and 5G, but uh, it will also use uh, new bands above uh, 100 gigahertz. And you see that uh, the higher the frequency, the more bandwidth is available. Um, between 100 and 250 gigahertz, not much is standardized yet, but uh, above. We uh, already see a preliminary IEEE standard. But before we uh, use uh, those uh, frequencies, we will first exploit the D band um, if, uh, between uh, 130 and uh, 175 gigahertz. The um, analog electronics in the communication context, yeah, they are making the bridge between the digital heart of the communication system and the outside world. So you see here at the transmit side, converter from digital to analog and then with a local oscillator that you make with a phase lock loop you upconvert a signal to RF uh, frequencies and then you transmit over over the air and at the receiver you have yeah, first uh, you have a low noise amplifier then we down convert uh, and after the analog uh, electronics we convert to the digital world where the complex uh, signal processing can begin An important challenge in the wireless communication is uh, the generation of power. So the higher the operating frequency in general, the more difficult it is to generate power. And also the uh, efficiency goes down. 
meaning that to get the required output power, you will need to use more DC power, so you will drain uh, your battery uh, more quickly. And also, amplifying power at high frequencies becomes more difficult for any semiconductor technology. Now, as an uh, illustration, you see here a scatter plot of the performance of many published uh, uh, CMOS power amplifiers. So I on purpose only showed uh, CMOS, but uh, the, the plot looks qualitatively the same for any other semiconductor technology. And so clearly you see the decreasing trend lines uh, for the maximum power as uh, frequency goes up. Now, the most simple uh, transceiver architecture that, that you see here is uh, used for all communications at the frequencies below the millimeter wave uh, region. It's also in your cell phone or tablet or Wi-Fi module of your laptop, for example. But uh, it's also the architecture in the base stations of, of wireless infrastructure. And here there is a, a dogma or an axiom, I could say. Whatever can be realized in CMOS, it is usually done in CMOS. But uh, when more power is needed than what CMOS can offer, then by CMOS or gallium arsenide or gallium uh, nitride uh, is uh, used instead. Let's now take a look at uh, communication at millimeter wave uh, frequency. So millimeter wave uh, starts uh, basically uh, from uh, 30 gigahertz, but yeah, uh, the, the, the first uh, allocated uh, 5G spectrum, uh, say starting from 24 gigahertz, we also uh, I called it uh, already the millimeter wave uh, region, and it stretches, uh, of course, uh, to the D, D band and the G band. Um, now, compared to lower frequencies, propagation losses at millimeter wave frequencies are higher and the transmitter is not capable to uh, generate much power, as I said uh, before. So to overcome this problem, we use uh, beamforming. Um, yeah, here's the animation. Uh, when you then split the signal that you transmit via the antennas over different paths, and you give to each part uh, an appropriate phase shift, then you can steer much energy in a particular di di direction while you hardly radiate in other directions. So compared to the classical architecture, single antenna architecture uh, that you see here, you duplicate part of the transceiver functionality and you add splitters yeah, or combiners in the, in the receive part and you uh, add uh, phase shifters as well. So um, if you express that the beamforming in, in formulas, what, what, what do you gain? Now at the transmit side, the uh, effective radiated power and the EIRP, it increases with the square of the number of antennas. So if you express it in an analog scale, you see uh, 20 log 10 of the number of uh, transmit antennas. So if we keep a given EIRP specification, it relaxes the power requirement for each power amplifier. This is beneficial for uh, RF hardware technologies, of course, in the light of what I said before, that the power generation at uh, high frequencies is problematic. Of course, if you exaggerate with the number of antennas, then you duplicate too much electronics, uh, and then you again consume too much power. I will come back on that uh, trade-off uh, later on. Now, at the receive side, what do you gain there? Well, you see that the uh, sensitivity level, it improves when we use more antennas. And uh, net, we, uh, when, 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 when we do beamforming, uh, beamforming with uh, the, the same number of transmit and receive antennas, we see an improvement with the third power of the number of antennas, or 30 log 10 of uh, N. Now, how will this uh, millimeter wave uh, functionality come into your uh, cell phone? Well, for 5G millimeter wave, uh, an array with a small number of antennas, for example, four, is put at several places of your phone, while the complex digital functionality is put somewhere centrally uh, in the phone. The reason why you use multiple transceivers is that uh, when you take your phone in your hand, your hand might block the millimeter wave path. Now, the footprint of uh, those uh, four antennas at uh, 20 gigahertz is not more than uh, two centimeters. 
the four antennas, yeah, they are nothing else but yeah, four metal patches. And yeah, for an efficient uh, radiation antenna theory shows that uh, the distance from uh, the center to center of uh, adjacent patches should be half of the wavelength. And at uh, 28 gigahertz, this is uh, 5.3 uh, millimeter. Now let's extend this concept uh, to the part of 6G that will operate above 100 gigahertz. I take as user equipment here a mobile phone, but, but the, this communication above 100 gigahertz can also land in other new device types. And I assume that um, there will again be several places uh, on your cell phone where an antenna array will be uh, placed. And if we assume operation at uh, 140 gigahertz, then this is five times higher in frequency than uh, the 28 uh, gigahertz frequency uh, for 5G. So on the same footprint of the antenna array for 28 gigahertz, you can put 25 times more antennas that operate at um, 140 gigahertz. If you imagine that uh, with each antenna a power amplifier is connected, then putting the entire beamforming electronics on one chip, yeah, that's not, not the best option. No? So we'll probably uh, distribute the transceiver electronics over different chips. And uh, here we see a future for yeah, heterogeneous uh, 3D integration. And yeah, uh, Europe has quite some strengths in, in uh, that, uh, not to forget. Now, if we need quite some antennas to do the beamforming at uh, 140 gigahertz, I already said that there is a trade-off to be made to optimize power consumption. If you take too few antennas, then each power amplifier has to generate relatively a lot of power, and at high frequencies, this cannot be done with a high efficiency. Now, if on the other hand, you take too many antennas, then you duplicate all the electronics in front of the power amplifiers. The power amplifier itself then does not need to transmit much power, but you consume much power um, in the too large overhead of duplicating the circuits before the power amplifier. And we see this uh, trade-off uh, for all uh, semiconductor uh, technologies that can be used today in the D-band. But uh, we see that uh, indium phosphide uh, gives by far the lowest uh, power consumption, um, uh, better than uh, by CMOS and uh, CMOS. Talking about uh, indium phosphide, Ah, oh, what is what is what is indium phosphide? Well, today, this is a niche technology, and it comes uh, with very small, brittle wafers. And how can we boost such technology uh, up with with several orders of magnitude to a scale that can meet the future demands for 6G? Well, uh, several R&D centers, uh, yeah, we at IMEC, uh, we, we, we uh, are doing uh, research, but uh, at LETI and, and, and uh, several places in Europe uh, also, we're doing uh, research to bring uh, this uh, indiophosphide technology to large 300 millimeter silicon wafers. So we show two examples uh, here of uh, what, what we are uh, doing at the research level today. So here left, uh, for example, you see a selective growth of, of, of a 3.5 material, uh, like indium phosphide onto silicon wafers in a way that, that uh, we minimize the crystal defects that you have by growing indium phosphide on, onto silicon. Um, yeah, silicon has a different lattice constant than uh, indium phosphide, and uh, as a result, you, 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 you are uh, sensitive to uh, crystal defects, and that, that would uh, ruin the performance of your uh, transistors. Uh, so that's uh, one approach. Here you see another one. I will not go uh, in, in, in detail. Uh, more approaches uh, can be found uh, uh, from uh, publications of uh, several um, res research uh, centers and uh, universities. So an entire 6G transceiver will then need multiple semiconductor uh, technologies. CMOS, yeah, definitely uh, for the, the, the complex uh, parts, uh, yeah, preferably at lower frequencies, but then maybe also in your phosphide. Um, uh, yeah, at the D-band, uh, in your phosphide uh, turns out to be uh, the, the best candidate. Now for the uh, lower frequency bands, uh, the, uh, 
that will be uh, the legacy bands of 5G, for example, the the uh, the 60 gigahertz band that that that, that will be uh, when 6G will be there. It will be uh, it norm uh, We expect that it uh, will be uh, already. Uh, in use by 5G. Well, for uh, those uh, frequency bands, um, yeah, maybe other uh, semiconductor technologies uh, can be useful as well, like uh, by CMOS. But anyway, it will be a blend of, of multiple uh, semiconductor uh, technologies and all distributed over multiple chips to, to do the beamforming. And then we also have uh, the uh, antenna array. And yeah, this complex combination will require either advanced PCB technology or something like uh, two and a half D, two and a half dimension uh, integration, or uh, 3D integration where we stack chips and antennas on top uh, of each other. And so here you see a picture of how this could look like. So at the bottom you have the CMOS part. And then in the middle, you have a layer uh, in indium phosphide, and on top, there is the array of antenna patches. I didn't say anything uh, yet uh, on uh, sensing uh, right now. Sensing will be combined with the uh, communication in uh, 6G. And therefore, it makes sense to look at the hardware architecture of uh, radar, which uh, is uh, our sensor. Now, the most widely used radar architecture uh, today uses uh, frequency modulation. So here you see the, the, the uh, architecture, the transmit architecture, uh, then, then uh, it, it, it hits uh, a target and then uh, the reflected wave uh, hits the uh, receiver of your uh, radar electronics. Um, so it transmits a signal from which the frequency increases linearly over time. Now, uh, compared to um, normal wireless communication, uh, where you have to, to, to transmit uh, uh, data, uh, um, for uh, frequency modulated uh, radar, you um, can saturate your power amplifier. And then, uh, yeah, as, as, as you see uh, in, in, in this graph, when, 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 when uh, the output of power really saturates, you can use it at uh, maximum efficiency. Uh, and there it behaves in a very nonlinear way. So in that sense, radar is less demanding for power amplifiers than communication. And then, so that's uh, for the transmit side, at the receive side, so there uh, we, we uh, we don't have uh, that uh, demanding uh, uh, specification of uh, generating uh, power. Uh, so here, yeah, you, you, you first have your low noise amplifier, then then then, then you uh, down convert with with uh, the the signal that uh, whose frequency uh, increases uh, linearly uh, over time uh, from the transmitter, and then you go uh, to uh, lower frequencies and the, to, to the digital domain, and then uh, in the digital domain you do your uh, radar pr processing and, and the classification of, of, of what, what, what you have uh, observed, and this complex uh, signal processing again will uh, require uh, CMOS, of course. So if we look at the future, millimeter wave radar will evolve to higher frequencies. Why is that? Well, um, at higher frequencies, you can use uh, more bandwidth. And this gives you better resolution to distinguish, to distinguish uh, objects. And also the resolution of the uh, orientation. So under which angle do I see the object? And the speed resolution, they are uh, better when uh, you uh, let your uh, radar operate at higher frequencies. Today, millimeter wave radar for automotive operates around 77 gigahertz, and we see uh, both uh, CMOS and uh, by CMOS as implementation technologies. And for indoor, very short uh, range radar, power can be uh, reduced drastically, and the uh, ISM band around 60 gigahertz is used by uh, some players to uh, make compact low power radars. Now, since, <clears throat> as I said, radar is less demanding for power amplifiers than for communication, silicon can be used uh, even up to very high frequencies. Now, since uh, with uh, bipolar transistors, 
you can uh, obtain higher frequencies than, than uh, with uh, CMOS transistors. We think that by CMOS will be an interesting technology for uh, radar at very high frequencies. So we see already uh, prototypes in, in, in by CMOS, uh, like, like here, uh, operating at uh, 240 gigahertz. So let me now come to the conclusions. So we see 6G transceivers, they will be a complex blend of, of yeah, many chips due to the beam forming uh, using different semiconductor technologies, and they will be linked together with um, heterogeneous uh, 2.5D or 3D uh, packaging technology. Now, CMOS probably cannot do it alone. So for uh, infrastructure, uh, non-CMOS uh, semiconductor technologies will be uh, definitely needed, but quite likely also uh, in uh, user equipment uh, that uh, will uh, be uh, that, that will be using uh, uh, D-band frequencies. And this is to overcome the speed and power limitations of uh, CMOS. So yeah, we're talking. We're talking then uh, when, when when we talk about non-CMOS technologies, we talk about um, indium phosphide. I, I touched uh, that one, uh, silicon germanium by CMOS, but uh, also uh, other technologies like uh, RF gallium nitride. Okay, gallium nitride can cannot uh, go as high in frequencies uh, as high in frequency as uh, indium phosphide, but but uh, for uh, the lower millimeter wave uh, frequency bands. Uh, it's uh, definitely uh, a contender because it can generate much more power than, than, than any silicon technology and also at a higher uh, efficiency. Um, now, those non-CMOS technologies, today uh, the processing capability worldwide, the number of FAPs, uh, how, how, how many chips can be uh, produced uh, per day in those technologies? Well, this capacity today is, is uh, relatively low, several orders of magnitude lower than, than for CMOS. But if uh, for 6G, where we expect huge quantities, if, if we uh, would think of adopting those non-CMOS uh, semiconductor technologies for, for user equipment, then a huge growth will be needed uh, for those um, non-CMOS technologies. Now, um, maybe a recommendation for Europe. So um, there is a bright future for, for those non-CMOS uh, technologies um, when we go to higher frequencies. So let's grow these uh, hardware technologies. Uh, they are already present in, in, in Europe. Huh? Uh, several uh, of them in the production phase already, other, other ones uh, at the research uh, level. And we should also capitalize on uh, uh, capitalize our know-how on uh, heterogeneous uh, integration. Uh, we have uh, good know-how in in, in uh, several uh, European companies, but also in in uh, several uh, R&D uh, companies. And to prepare well for 6G, well, um, we should um, create the good boundary conditions by already. Uh, Introducing 5G in Europe as soon as possible. That comes, uh, for example, with, with uh, defining a consistent uh, spectrum uh, policy, uh, of course. So um, these were my uh, conclusions and some uh, recommendations for uh, Europe. So thank you all for your uh, attention. I'm open to uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Are there any questions from the audience? So a question here, introducing 5G, do you mean millimeter wave band? Uh, sorry, can you repeat uh, the, the, the uh, introducing was... Introducing 5G, do you mean introducing millimeter wave bands uh yeah uh, among others okay uh 5g of course uh, I, the, 
the first uh, 5G uh, uh, devices will not operate at millimeter wave uh, frequencies, but of course, the yeah, the millimeter wave uh, frequency bands will will come, uh, yeah, one day or or another. Uh, it will come when 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 the, the the spectrum below is saturated. But uh, yeah, okay. 6G will also have uh, legacy bands uh, or, or frequency bands uh, at lower frequencies uh, of of millimeter wave. So um, yeah, uh, and 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 then also there uh, probably uh, the 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 first uh, deployment of uh, 6G. Uh, maybe it will not be at at millimeter wave, but but we should make sure that we don't miss the boat of 6G. And 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 uh, this comes. Uh, with uh, a fast deployment of, of 5G that that we are all, that we're already used to, uh, yeah, uh, working with 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 uh, yeah lower latencies uh, with 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 uh, more bandwidth than than uh, with uh, 4G. Thank you. Uh, and there's another question here. Does the tech choice heavily depend on the waveform that may be selected? For instance, more or less tolerance to non-linearity and impact on PA operations. Uh, yes, but uh, I think it will be uh, more a matter of uh, economics, uh, as uh, as usual. Eh? Uh, so, but but I don't see uh, yeah, too many uh, differences. Um, I for com for communication. Yeah, yeah uh, you, you you will always uh, communicate uh, with with waveforms that that uh, yeah if 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 you use uh, complex uh, modulation you will always have uh, waveforms with with a relatively high peak to average power rate so so your power amplifier uh, technology needs needs to uh, withstand that for radar of course uh, I I said okay if uh, as long as we do a frequency modulated uh, continuous wave uh, radar. Then of course uh, the, the 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 peak to average power ratio is is uh, small, and then and then then uh, then we can keep on using silicon technologies. If we would switch to OFDM radar or something, yeah, then of course it will be more demanding as well. And then maybe there also we might have to reach out to 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 uh, yeah more yeah today exotic uh, technologies like uh, in your slide. Thank you very much. If you have any further questions please provide them in the chat and Piet can reply to them on the chat. And we move on to the final presentation in this session, uh, also from Cornect, uh, the sensor processing in 6G by Patrick Pike. Okay, thank you. So I will uh, share my screen. So there we go. Normally one should see the screen yes okay so then i will put it on this one okay thank you uh, in fact i had a difficult task to be the last speaker of today just before lunch but uh, let's see what this brings so i will talk about sensor processing in 6g and in fact we will look at this from a different perspective uh, we will look at it from an automotive part from a connectivity infrastructure perspective what about industrial applications and then consumer grade connectivity more in particular in the health area and then we will show some evolution how we see the integration of communication and sensing and we will also include some example use cases and uh, very specific requirements for the future so let me start with automotive connectivity uh, what we see there is a huge change in mobility uh, connectivity is really driving the future of mobility if you look to modern cars they are equipped with uh, different types of sensors cameras radars lidars and all is needed to evolve from what we call ADAS towards fully autonomous driving uh, and uh, in fact, in most of the modern cars, there are already uh, the features uh, which help, uh, for example, like automated parking, like uh, uh, automatic cruise control, uh, assisted cruise control, etc. We also need to focus on a number of regulation topics in order to uh, continue uh, the evolution that we have set in the automotive sector. And we see a number of requirements from a short term to long term. 
Uh, I will not go into the full details here, but I think what is important is that we continue uh, to work together with public authorities, with industry, with RTOs towards standardization and regulation activities in order also to minimize, for example, interference of automotive radar and consumer devices with V2V, uh, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure communication and also 5-6G in the future. So we need, as already indicated also by previous speakers, we need a consistent, consistent EU spectrum policy uh, combining licensed, unlicensed, global local licenses for automotive radar applications uh, and also look at radiation power and out of band emissions. And we have to bring into the world radio conference. Medium term, we see really an evolution from uh, towards integrated communication and sensing. Uh, standardization is needed in RGPPP for introduction in 2030. And longer term, of course, we need to continue working on the standardization and regulation activities and on the EU spectrum policy. So now the next one is uh, connectivity infrastructure and here we see uh, also evolutions. So we see new spectrum bands will drive semiconductor process development as was already also indicated by Gerhard and Piet. Uh, we need further advances in the sub terahertz and the terahertz bands and we need to focus on technology uh, funding uh, programs, uh, real investments in Europe. And here you see an example of the 6G spectrum bands and what it can bring in terms of, for example, sensing in short range, hotspot capacity, urban capacity, wide area coverage, etc. So here also we have a number of requirements ranging from short term to long term. I think what is important and sometimes forgotten is that we also need to have enough talent in Europe. And so we need to educate and attract sufficient I see design engineers, semiconductor process development engineers uh, and also packaging, for example, is becoming more and more challenging. And this needs to be done in uh, front end fabs. And therefore, we can, for example, use the IPSE program to ensure that the necessary uh, capabilities and uh, production facilities uh, can be built in Europe. So we definitely need more advanced packaging. Uh, for example, also for the antenna integration on chip. Uh, and that is a, a knowledge that can be uh, considered to be extremely good in Europe. And beyond the knowledge, I think we can also look at the uh, production within Europe. Medium term, we see an enhancement of derivative technologies, uh, as already indicated also by Pete. Uh, CMOS is of course the preferred solution, but not uh, usable for a number of applications. So therefore we need silicon, germanium by CMOS, RF, gallium nitride, SOI. And as you can see, longer term, uh, indium phosphide is also a solution which is expected. So we need the combination of electronics and photonics concepts. We need the enhancement of packaging solutions, RATCOM and also policy is important. If you look at the industrial application, uh, we see robotics is of course a key area and this will not only be in uh, uh, industry, but also in the future we expect more and more at the home uh, robotic equipment. And there the focus needs to be on smart sensors, which can do a very detailed measurement and which can also communicate to the outside world, meaning to other equipment and to users and to uh, people uh, walking around. Question is, of course, how to power these, dev these devices in an environmentally friendly way. So attention needs to be built on power efficiency, energy harvesting and energy efficient software coding. And we need to facilitate a circular economy on a longer term. So here also in terms of industrial grade connectivity, we see short term needs for solar powered devices, uh, solar powered Bluetooth enabled sensors, for example. We need to make progress in terms of cost and reliability. Uh, reliability has to further increase, cost has to go down and performance has to go up. We need AI cores for edge sensors for minimum power consumption of the sensors. Further research is needed on batteries, integrated batteries, energy harvesting technologies, microsolar panels, 
and also in wireless charging, we need to further improve and evolve. So medium term, uh, again, lower, lowering the cost, increasing the performance or the key words, uh, improve AI cores for edge sensors and further research on alternative solutions for power distribution and optical communication. Longer term, energy harvesting should become more and more applied. Uh, we need research over power over the fiber uh, and we need integration of micro batteries into ICs. Then fourth, what's happening at the consumer level? And of course, consumer is a wide area. I'm not talking here about all types of consumer devices like mo mo smartphones, etc. But I would like to emphasize a bit on the health aspect. Uh, we see more and more that health is evolving from hospital towards home and that people have to stay as long as possible at home or recover uh, as much as possible at home. So we really need connectivity here uh, between the electronic health records of a patient, operating room connectivity and remote patient monitoring. And everything should be connected and everything should be ensured that everyone has the same data available. Of course, taking into account the privacy ruling and ensuring that privacy is maintained. So short term, what is needed is the Internet of Medical Things, uh, enabling patient general health data uh, to be available. Create acceptance for sensitive data with regulations. So as stated, uh, privacy, uh, ethics are of key importance in the medical sector and authentication and personal sharing permissions. Cybersecurity uh, is, of course, key in this field. We also need new approaches for business models and we have to build up electronic health records in an efficient and correct way. Medium term, uh, we need definitely the secured digital health platforms. We need portable end user devices. Uh, the market has already opened on that uh, and needs further expansion, remote e-healthcare and AI integrated in the electronic health record in the Internet of Medical Things. Longer term, we uh, need scalable digital health platforms, next generation devices and holistic healthcare systems with data based in Europe. Now I would like to uh, talk a bit on how the evolution of integrated communication and sensing, uh, how we see it. And in fact, as an example case, I would look at uh, the road to autonomous driving. <laughs> if you look at 1990, in fact, uh, the communication was mainly based on wired wireless uh, communication by road signs, uh, uh, road signs uh, which were electronic. Then we are evolving towards 2, 3, 4G cellular telematics uh, came up in the years 2000 and e-call is now a mandatory requirement in every new car sold on the market. And so we are evolving uh, now towards 802.11p and LTE V2X with 4.5G uh, with the new uh, generation of advanced driver assistance systems. And we see an evolution in the future to full autonomous and comfort driving, uh, also measuring uh, the health status of drivers uh, to uh, see whether they are getting tired, to see whether they are still paying full attention if they are driving themselves and of course full autonomous driving in the future based on smart cameras, LIDARs, radars, 5G, 6G communication and V2X. So here if we look at the car of the future, we see that uh, sensors like a radar needs to be combined with different communication techniques and resolution and robustness are key. Uh, because you need to have uh, indeed the right resolution level dependent of the uh, requirement of the car, whether you work with adaptive cruise control or whether you do automatic parking requires different types of resolution and sensor devices. Then we need radar and V2X combination to be combined in order to have a combined perception and to have a better perception of the environment in which the car is driving around. And then, of course, you also need radar enhanced data communication, higher rates, more efficiency, uh, not only big data, but what is the data which is really needed to make decisions within the car or even outside the car. 
So here we see a picture where we now today have separate communication and radar systems in the car. These are two different types of uh, platforms, so to speak, which uh, in fact needs to be integrated in the future. Uh, we are evolving towards a cooperative radar cycling positioning. Uh, we are then uh, going to the next era of sensing assisted communication. And then, of course, at the end, we will come to a fully integrated communication and sensing environment uh, within the car, but also in other applications, as already indicated in industry, in consumer sector, etc. So here is some examples of use cases for joint uh, communication and sensing. Important is to further improve the network performance, to enhance automotive safety, uh, to evolve towards a connected, cooperative and automated mobility and to work on specific use cases. One use case is, for example, intersection safety. One knows that uh, pedestrians and bicycles are still the weak parts in the traffic. Uh, we hear still a lot about blind spot accidents, for, for example, when a bicycle is hit by a truck. Uh, it's thanks to uh, the integration of sensing and communication uh, the further improvement of radar with a higher uh, perception of the environment around that in the future these vulnerable road users will be much more protected than as of today in traffic. Another one is an intelligent speed assistance. So speed being adapted according to the environments uh, in which you are driving. I think uh, I already talked about adaptive cruise control, which is just one example, but there are much more cases where intelligent speed assistance is a must have. And then also, for example, on uh, the uh, industrial floor, where you have a safety of robots and human interaction, where in fact a robot can detect uh, if some person is coming too close and can take automatically corrective action in order that the person is not hurt by the movements of the ro robots, for example. A number of specific requirements that we clearly see uh, towards this is the combination of beam forming and beam sweeping over time. Sensing should be a feature offered by the network with fully immersive spatial sensing and monitoring. We need a hybrid approach where, in fact, some activities are more vehicle centric, while others are more uh, infrastructure centric. And we need to find the right trade off of where the processing is taking place. Is it uh, processing at the edge? Is it processing in a central processor in a certain car domain? Or is the processing done in the infrastructure around? Radar localization, sensor fusion, uh, we uh, come more and more to multiple sensors, different types of sensors combined together and sensor fusion becomes more and more important to extract the right data in the right circumstances uh, for the right decision making. Digital twins are of course uh, an evolution which we cannot avoid and then of course we need reconfigurable infrastructure devices for example for uh, different Wi-Fi applications and for cellular. So that concludes my presentation uh, and I would say if there are any questions I'm open to answer. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? I think everyone is looking hungry for lunch. <laughs> yes. I have I have one question, Patrick, uh, concerning the timing of uh, 5G in the automotive. So you had it uh, there on your slide, uh, something like uh, 2030 time frame. So uh, could you comment uh, more on the timing there? Well, this is a, a time which we think is realistic. Uh, I mean, it's of course hard to predict. Uh, 5G is just starting to roll out in society. Uh, so now, in fact, it's uh, used for a number of, I would say, experimental activities and lab activities in different car applications. And before it can be really rolled out, I think this will still require some term. Whether it is now 2028, 2029, 2030, that's of course hard to predict. But at least it will take at least five years before uh, some commercial applications in the car environment will take place. All right. Any other questions?
seems not. People are anticipating the lunch, I suppose. Here's a question. Uh, do you see communication plus sensing as relevant only for the auto use cases? Uh, no, it's definitely not only for auto use cases. I think I mentioned also some examples in an industrial environment, for example. Uh, I think also in a future environment at home, there will be applications. Uh, I think auto will be one of the drivers to uh, get into that direction. And we see this often that automotive uh, microelectronics is often a driver uh, for uh, advanced designs and advanced technologies, which are then applied in a later stage for other uh, applications. Thank you. I don't think there are any more questions, so I would like to thank all the speakers for uh, um, the session and uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, after lunch, we're going to continue with the last session on connecting intelligence towards 6G at 2 p.m. Central European time. So thank you all and see you later. Thank you. Have a good lunch.